Canada's health care system urgently needs highly trained, highly skilled professionals at all levels. The need for doctors is acute and growing. But with only 2,800 spots annually in this country to begin the multi-year training required to become a doctor, it's hard to see how supply meets demand. But could there be a solution in Canadians trained abroad as doctors and eager to return home to work? Let's get into this. And as is our custom, we'll introduce our guests from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in Sydney, Nova Scotia, with The Globe and Mail's Greg Mercer, whose investigative reporting shone a light on this topic, in particular uncovering the many Canadian medical students studying abroad. Also joining us in the nation's capital, Dr. Glenn Bandiera, an emergency room physician at St. Michael's Hospital and executive director of Standards and Assessment at the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. And Dr. Rohit Gandhi, also an ER doctor at the Hospital Montfort. And here in our studio, Dr. Lisa Salomon, an ER doctor at the Scarborough Health Network and Sinai Health, who is the Ontario Medical Association District Chair for Toronto. And it's great to have you, Dr. Solomon, back in our program here. And to our friends in Points Beyond, thank you for joining us as well. Greg, I'm going to start with you for the first couple of minutes off the top here, just because your series really shone a light on this whole issue that we're going to be discussing tonight. Give us your best guess as to how many Canadians are abroad trying to become doctors at foreign universities. Well, thanks, Steve. The best guess that we have is that there's at least several thousand. There was a study uh, about a decade ago that had the number at about 3,500. It's hard to peg exactly, but we can safely say there are several thousand Canadians, as we speak, who are getting medical degrees um, at, at universities outside of Canada. As we And why do they go there as opposed to trying to find a space in a medical school in Canada? Absolutely, yeah. These are folks who, in many cases, were frustrated because they couldn't get into a medical school in Canada. I mean, nine out of ten applicants um, are rejected for Canadian medical school because of, of capacity. There's not enough spaces. So they go abroad. Um, many times they have impeccable degrees, uh, sorry, impeccable uh, grades and, and uh, qualifications, and they would make very good physicians. So they've simply gone elsewhere. Um, and, and they're paying out of their own pocket to get that education. And that's what I wanted to confirm. It's not that they're not good enough to get into schools here. There's just no space. That's right? Yeah, it's a space issue, really. Okay. Uh, I want to bring a graph up that uh, was in your reportage, and this is it's going to compare two things. And for those listening on podcast and who can't see these two bar graphs here, we're going to compare red bars and blue bars. The red bars show a very large number of applicants that are accepted into international med schools, and the blue bars right beside, as we compare year over year over year, show that a very small percentage, maybe 20 or 30 percent, who are actually accepted into residency programs back here in Canada when they're done. And I guess the question that emerges from that, Greg, is why so few people getting so few spaces back here when they graduate? Well, I think it's deliberate, right? We only give about 13% of all residencies to international medical grads. Um, and the argument is uh, that it's the system is deliberately protecting graduates of Canadian medical schools. Um, and I think the other thing that we ought to be paying attention to is, is the decline in applications from international medical grads who are increasingly seeing Canada as, as not, a, not a viable option to become a physician. So they're going elsewhere. And I think those numbers show that. And I think we ought to be concerned at a time when the competition for physicians is only uh, growing ar around the world. And one last thing before we get everybody else involved here, and that is, uh, I, I think everybody can understand why you'd want to favor Canadians trained in Canada for the relatively few number of spots in schools here in Canada, or residency programs in Canada. But does the system not give favoritism as well to Canadians who may be trained abroad, but who, after all, are Canadian? Not formally, no. In the eyes of, of the system, they are all international applicants. It's they're not. The system isn't concerned whether or not they were born in Canada or were or raised in Canada or, or whatever. Um, it's it's the school that they were educated at. That's how they're they're uh, they're counted. Um, so you know, there are a lot of Canadians who would like to come home, who would like to be part of the solution to, to help with the, with physician shortages in their communities, who are being blocked from doing it because there's so few residencies that are available to them. Gotcha. Okay, Greg, thanks for that background. Let's now get some reports from the front lines here. And this is, of course, a, per a particularly timely conversation. Lisa, I'll start with you. Um, you know, a woman died in the uh, 
in a hospital uh, in Nova Scotia just this past week, waiting and waiting and waiting for treatment, couldn't get in, uh, waiting for care in the ER. Uh, you sort of, uh, you work in two different ERs, right, in the, in the Toronto area? What's, what's your first-hand experience of what you're seeing these days? Yeah, I mean, that is horrible what what happened um, out east. I mean, it's it's devastating. And we could easily see how that could happen. You know, I'm fortunate in the hospitals where I work that we do our best to see patients um, as quickly as we can. But in doing so, we're using unconventional spaces. So, you know, back a few years ago, uh, pre-COVID, we talked about hallway medicine and ending hallway medicine. And now we have waiting room medicine. You, know, and you have waiting room medicine? We have waiting room medicine. You treat patients in the waiting we, room? We treat patients in the waiting waiting room. So our beds are often blocked in the emergency department with admitted patients. That's because there's no space to, to move them up uh, to the floors. And so in order to be able to see patients, we're offering, in, we're uh, often initially assessing them in the waiting room, which, I mean, personally, who, who likes that, right? The, the patients don't have the same privacy as a clinician. I may not be able to do a full physical exam and as much as I would like to do, but which is better, having them wait with no assessment, with no treatment, or being able to see them as quickly as possible. But it's less than optimal, you would agree? Uh, of course, it's less than optimal. But okay. it, once again, what happened out east, you know, is, which is devastating, you know, had she been perhaps assessed in the waiting room, you know, maybe things could have been differently. But in many places, they don't do that for various reasons, a lot of, and I don't blame people for not wanting to do that. So we do the best that we can do. And, you know, people will often complain that, we, we've heard complaints about people saying, well, I was in a broom closet or I was in a storage room mm -hmm. um, or I'm in the waiting room. And it's something we have to balance. So it's been very challenging over the last few years, that's for sure. Let's get the view from Eastern Ontario. Uh, Dr. Gandhi, what's it like? Like at, uh, at the Mont Four, yeah. So some very similar stories to Dr. Solomon. Uh, I think we're seeing patients in the waiting room. We're overwhelmed, and um, you know, I know the discussion is largely around physician shortages, which is certainly uh, something we need to highlight. But it's a systemic issue. Um, we're short across the entire uh, human resource spectrum in healthcare, and I think you know, just looking at the physician shortage is a small piece of the pie. We're really missing all of the ancillary services, the support, the systemic changes that need to happen for us to move away from that waiting room medicine. Um, you know, we, we have physicians that are just burnt out, um, not able to practice that one full-time equivalency um, that you would expect that has happened in the past because of the shortages and the burdens and uh, the working conditions uh, have been become pretty difficult. So I certainly welcome um, ideas of bringing all these international graduates to help increase capacity. But until the system changes occur, I think we're, in, we're gonna be in trouble for some time. Dr. Glenn Bandiero, what's the view from St. Mike's? Well, certainly it's, it's very similar. And uh, I, I always liken these various aspects of the system as a, as a bathtub. And it doesn't really matter how big the bathtub is. If what's coming in is greater than what's going out, it's going to overflow eventually. Um, so these are all system issues that are predicated on adequate resources and, and throughput strategies. And I do think that uh, health human resources is important uh, as a factor in solving this. And it's not just about getting people into the system, but it's keeping them in the system and keeping them working to their full potential. And I think that's really the risk of the burnout issue that Dr. Gandhi's identified. Let me follow up with you, Glenn, because you've kind of got two hats on today. You're a doc, but you're also uh, part of the uh, Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons. You have responsibilities there. So put that hat on and tell us whether you think we need to take uh, special efforts to get Canadians who are trained overseas into our healthcare system back home, as so many of them want to be practicing back home. Well, the Royal College is a national partner and we are responsible for setting the standards for certification in all of the disciplines uh, outside of family medicine. And we do that in lockstep with our colleagues at the uh, College of Family Medicine, uh, um, College of Family Physicians of Canada, uh, as well as the College de Médecins de Quebec. So it's a national uh, approach across the three certifying colleges. And we certainly recognize the potential of individuals who've trained in uh, accredited programs uh, outside of Canada. And it's important to understand that the people that are uh, eligible to enter into both residencies and into licensed practice uh, are Canadians or permanent residents. Uh, and they've got a medical degree or residency training outside of Canada. And when we put those two things together, those are the, the, the two important criteria uh, for us. 
So whether they're Canadian before they went to medical school or they went to medical school and then immigrated to Canada to become Canadian and then eligible for work and licensure um, is not relevant in our decision making uh, as we're focused on uh, competence and the ability to meet the expectations of uh, Canadians and give them the, the type of service that they uh, expect and deserve and have confidence in. Um, so that, that's really the we have. Okay, one more follow-up, and that is th there's no suspicion that they're somehow not as qualified as those trained in Canada, is there? No, not at all. I, our goal is really to allow all who have the competencies required to be able to demonstrate those as quickly and efficiently as possible, and, and that's the, uh, the ultimate goal that we're working towards. Okay, Lisa Salman, do, do you know whether you work with any doctors who are foreign trained but Canadian? Oh, lots. You do? Yes. Is there any diminution in their skills compared to people who are trained here? No, absolutely not. Should there be accommodation made to try to get more foreign trained docs who are Canadians into situations here in Canada? Oh, for sure. I mean, it's definitely one of the short-term solutions that we should be looking at. There are many Canadians here who have been trained abroad who are practice ready. And what we need to do um, in Ontario is to develop a practice ready assessment program, which is a short 12 week program where they have mentorship and to make sure that they meet the standards uh, that we expect here in Canada, as Dr. Bandieri said. Uh, there's seven provinces in Canada that already have this program and these are people who already have finished their residencies elsewhere and who have practiced in other countries as well but now are in Canada and want to practice and so I think it would be very helpful for uh, those people uh, for a practice ready assessment program to be created in Ontario and the government needs to be able to create that and fund that and in addition you know we spoke earlier about residency programs for internationally uh, medical grads so we definitely need to increase those spots for what we call IMG uh, you know people who have gone to medical school abroad and need residency as well. Rohit is this much of a subject of conversation between you and your colleagues at the Montfort? Yeah I mean I, I certainly agree with with Dr. Solomon I think the the interesting component to this is that you know, the majority of physicians are actually working in urban centers. And so although there's a shortage, and we see that especially ubiquitously across family medicine, we really have to understand that the greatest shortage is really in underserviced areas and areas where um, we have more rural populations. It's, it's sort of that inverse care law, which sort of states that the availability of good medical care really varies inversely with the need of the population served. So not only do we need to sort of identify areas of of capacity building for, for IMGs to come to Canada, but we need to find ways to sort of encourage them to practice in the areas of focus um, that are most at need, such as primary care and family medicine, but also in the areas that are underserviced, uh, where you're not really seeing uh, you know, physicians attracted or being attracted to these areas. Greg, maybe you could help us better understand what underserviced means, because I think the suspicion is people think we're talking moose and ear. But I have heard, uh, I've heard many times over the years that Alliston, which is an hour north of this studio, is an underserved area as well. So help us understand that better. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, all provinces in Canada use what we call return of service agreements. They're essentially contracts that they require um, international medical grads to sign if they get a residency here. And essentially, it's, uh, they're, they're paying back the province for the cost of their residency. That's how the, the provinces view it. And they assign them to what the provinces view as underserved communities. And those are generally, I mean, those can be places like, um, you know, Kitchener, Ontario, which, which you wouldn't generally see as underserved, but in the view uh, of the province, that's a smaller center. Um, it is a contentious issue, however. We don't require this of Canadian medical graduates. And there are, there are Canadians who have returned home who say that these contracts are a deterrent. It's why we are losing physicians to other countries, that, that in the U.S., for instance, we don't require this uh, of, of graduates. Where do we lose them to the most? What countries? Uh, a lot go to the U.S. Uh, we're increasingly using, losing them to uh, Britain, to Australia, uh, to countries that have uh, cleared the pathway for them to, to work without these restrictions. Uh, in Australia, um, these contracts that assign you to underserviced um, communities are based on where you go to medical school. If you get acceptance, regardless of whether you're Australian or not, you, you agree to go to an underserviced community if you go to a rural university. We don't do that here. We take a different approach. And for some IMGs, they say that it feels especially punitive. Hmm. Glenn, do we need to do something about that? 
Well, I think the needs of the various jurisdictions are, are quite unique and um, contextual to, to each province. So the licensing authorities in each province uh, take different approaches to, to provision of licenses. Um, our national approach is, is really about setting the standard for certification um, in the disciplines uh, across uh, Canada. And um, but this is a, a very, really vexing issue because we talk about the right number and mix and distribution and number is who's graduating from medical school The the mix is what disciplines they choose to go into, i.e. do we have enough psychiatrists, do we have enough general surgeons, but the distribution issue is where they end up practicing and, and that is a very vexing problem uh, nationally. Uh, it's challenging enough even within provinces, um, but to have a national strategy, it's something we're working towards, but it's, it's a very complicated issue. Well, Greg, just so we understand this, let's say you're from Alliston, Ontario, and you couldn't get a spot in a Canadian med school, so you decide to go to a foreign medical school. You graduate, you do well, you want to come home to Alliston and practice. Right now, you don't have any extra dibs on, on getting back to Alliston than anybody else? If, if you're one of the lucky ones to get a residency, if you are internationally uh, educated, you are you are assigned essentially to an underserved um, region. So you, you don't have control in those perhaps first five years of your career where you go. Um, and that's, uh, that, that, that is a problem for some physicians. And, and we do have people who, who default on those agreements. Um, so uh, it, it causes a lot of stress for those people. And uh, again, they, they, they say, why are we not requiring these kind of agreements of people whose education we subsidize? Canadian graduates, we don't re ask the same of them. It's only someone who's gone abroad to, and paid their own, uh, paid for their own education. And I think we need to ask that question. Dr. Salomon, does that make sense to you? So I don't think that's exactly the way it works from my understanding. So yes, for international medical graduates, when they come here, they have to do what's called a return to service and go to a underserviced area. For how long? For I believe it's five years. Okay. But it's not that they're told they have to go to this one spot in particular. I, I believe that they have the choice of any or a, a large amount of underserviced areas. And many, like you said, are fairly close to urban centers and even in urban centers. So, for example, a few years ago, if you went just north of the city to Richmond Hill um, and you were a family doctor, there was an area just east of Bathurst, north of Steeles, that was considered underserviced for family doctors. So it's not necessarily, like you said, you know, really remote rural areas. There are some, you know, suburban areas that are considered underserviced as well. But when we talk about shortages and we're talking about this a potential pool of, of physicians who can help with the shortages, we need to look at the data and we need to look at which specialties are we short in, what areas do we need physicians in. So you know. I understand why some of them may feel it's unfair, but we're, we're trying to solve a problem. And in order to solve the problem, we need to put the supply where the demand is. But presumably, they're part of the solution. These foreign-trained Canadian doctors are part of multitudinous solutions here, are they not? They're part of the solution, but part of where we need these physicians. Hmm. And if we need these physicians in underserviced areas, then that's how that's going to help us solve it. And we also need to look at uh, we know for sure that we have a shortage of family doctors. I mean, there are over 1 million Ontarians without a family doctor. So we need to look, get more data to see what other specialties that we're short of too. We know we're short of psychiatrists. We know we have a shortage in emergency physicians. Um, and there's probably many other specialties as well. So it's important to get that data and what locations specifically that we need these physicians to serve as well. Dr. Gandhi, when, when the people who make these decisions are considering foreign trained doctors, do you think they should give preference to Canadians who are foreign trained over those who are not Canadian? I think uh, at the outset that does happen. So a lot of the program directors who are in charge of making the decisions, they're looking at uh, several different factors. I think to remain equal and to sort of, uh, you know, avoid any sort of human rights issues, I think we have to sort of look at every application and treat them equally. But you do see some um, weight put on Canadian graduates, uh, and I think that was sort of mentioned in Greg's article, that the program directors have some discretion in, in better understanding whether or not a graduate can come back and, and, and sort of if there is a, a draw back to that, um, that practice location or that area where they're from, I think there is some, some level of weight that's put on that to bring them back home. Dr. Bandiera, d does your organization make attempts to shorten 
the, the wait times for Canadians who are foreign trained to get back into their own country and find a spot to work? We're making efforts to streamline the process for all eligible applicants. And again, I have to be careful to say that, um, you know, whether you were Canadian before you went to medical school or you became a Canadian after you went to medical school, uh, for, for us, doesn't doesn't matter. You're uh, either way, you, you have to be a Canadian or permanent resident to, to get a license and, and embark in these pathways. Um, so having said that, um, We've looked at a number of process elements to really shorten the time to assess the training that's done abroad because training is quite heterogeneous around the world and we need to make sure that it uh, does um, adhere to the expectations of Canadian society. But then we also have to make sure that people coming back are able to adapt that training to the Canadian context because they weren't trained in the Canadian context. And, and that's the process that we're embarking on right now with our practice eligibility route um, to shorten that. And we've already taken some pretty dramatic steps at the Royal College to shorten that assessment period uh, and get people into practice, usually in a supervised environment of some kind, so somebody can keep an eye on them for a period of time, uh, make sure that that transition goes smoothly and they are meeting the expectations. Uh, and then eventually they uh, write our examinations and move into full practice. Uh, so we're looking at all options to, to shorten that duration for all uh, competent individuals regardless of, um, of their, their training. Just so we get a better sense of what you mean, you've shortened it from what to what? One of the application steps is the assessment of training uh, that they've had elsewhere and that in the past could take anywhere from six to 18 months um, depending on the nature of the jurisdiction they're coming from and we've removed a couple of steps in that process that can shorten it to as uh, little as uh, two to three months for that initial assessment. And then once that's done, they can become exam eligible and get a provisional license and start serving Canadians uh, until such time as they eventually do the exam and pass it and become uh, independent practitioners. Well, let's talk about the job itself for a second. Um, Lisa, you used to be a family doc. Mm -hmm. You're now an ER doc. How come you switched? So I always did both. I did family medicine and emergency medicine. Uh, and I realized, you know, there's so much administrative burden in family medicine. And that is an important thing is that we need to look at retention of family doctors, too. There are so many people in, in sort of my age group who are leaving family medicine, as well as 25 percent of family doctors in Ontario are over the age of 60. So in the next five years, we expect a lot of family physicians to retire. Dr. Tara Kieran did a study of Toronto physicians and about 450. Uh, family physicians responded and 20% of them said they expect to leave family practice in the next five years. So we need to look at what, what's going on? Why are so many family doctors leaving family medicine? And I want to say, first of all, there's a lot of burnout. Why is this? There's a lot of administrative burden. People are spending 10 hours a week doing paperwork. Doctors. Doctors. Don't they have people do that for them? No, and that's what we're asking for. So we went into medicine to treat patients. We went into medicine to be doctors. And many of us feel that we're essentially doing secretarial work, making referrals. There's so much what we call electronic medical record bloat, spending so much time in front of the computer, following up on results, getting all sorts of reports, filling out forms. You say computer. I know doctors who still use fax machines. Never mind computers, right? This is still a thing. Yes, for sure, <laughs> for sure. So definitely what we need is, you know, we've been advocating for teams. So every um, Ontarian having a team of providers working together with their family doctor, all linked on the same electronic medical record so that every so that everybody can work to their full scope, um, you know, having uh, social workers available, dietitians, uh, physiotherapists, pharmacists, and that way physicians can do what they do best, and that is being a doctor. It would also be nice to have scribes, uh, physician assistants, people to be able to do um, a lot of the paperwork that, you know, we don't necessarily need to do. And, you know, we've really been advocating for the government for funding for that. And I think that would really help First of all, to people to go into family medicine and also to stay in family medicine. And I think that those things are some of the solutions. Rohit Gandhi, can I get you to build on that answer? I mean, the, the real interesting part of this is that there was 115 spots that went unmatched in 2022. And the large majority of them were family medicine. So we talk about increasing capacity, especially for IMGs, international graduates, but there was 115 spots that just went unmatched. And we really have to think why. 
And I think to Dr. Solomon's point, we have to find ways to get people into family medicine and to think about why that career can be better supported uh, so we can attract more people into a field that we really need. And uh, that's a, a large number. Okay, Greg Mercer, let's, uh, in our last five minutes, get you back in here. I know that when reporters do big takeout series, as you just did, uh, you're, you're, you're kind of loath to make recommendations at the end of it. Your job is to lay the facts out there and the decision makers take from it what they will. But I presume you came away with some ideas of some conclusions that would be useful in this case. You want to share some ideas with us? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I would say that, that step one would be increasing the number of residencies for international medical graduates. Um, uh, it is certainly more cost effective and, and much faster uh, of a method to add physicians into the system than expanding uh, domestic Canadian medical school seats. Uh, and, and I think we're seeing some provinces beginning to recognize that. Nova Scotia, Newfoundland and Labrador have in recent months uh, made announcements that they're, they're adding more residencies specifically for um, for IMGs, people who are educated abroad, let other countries bear the cost of educating these folks, and 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 then when they're ready, they come here. It's it's a faster, cheaper way to add qualified doctors into our system. Okay, and would you at the same? Uh, incidentally, IMGs. We keep talking IMGs, international medical grads, just for the acronym there. Uh, in terms of increasing residencies, do you believe that there is a need to favor Canadians for those spots over those who are not Canadian? Well, I, I, think, it, I think it is being done uh, informally. I think that the point was made earlier um, that the residency coordinators might look for someone who is from the community or from the province who has roots there and is more likely to be retained as a physician. Um, but certainly you hear that argument from Canadians abroad who say, we are treated no different um, when it comes to being able to compete for for residencies uh, as someone from anywhere else, right? They they, they would like to have um, they would like to have uh, extra avenues open to them. Okay, Dr. Bandiera, if increased residencies is part of the solution to this problem, whose job is it to make that happen? Well, uh, another previous role I had was as the uh, postgraduate dean at the University of Toronto, so I, I live this reality as well. Um, the training positions are funded by the provincial ministries of health, and they determine the, the number of spots and, and how they're allocated across both disciplines and the applicant populations. Uh, so the ministries uh, would need to step up with that capacity and, and whatever provisions they feel are, are best uh, suited to meet their uh, contextual needs. Um, there are capacity issues within schools. Even if there was funding, there, there would still be some bottlenecks in terms of training because as people have alluded to, people are pretty pretty stretched and pretty thin, and uh, we need people to train uh, individuals uh, when they do come. So uh, the funding is for sure the biggest issue, and uh, the, the second is training capacity. I think there's opportunities for sure there. Okay, uh, well, the Minister of Health, if she were here, would say, we're already spending $70 billion a year on health care for people in Ontario. How much more would you like us to spend in order to increase the number of residency positions available? It's all, it's all a numbers game. I mean, we, we know that it takes about a million dollars to train a medical student through to graduation, and then about $100,000 a year plus salary uh, to bring a resident through the residency programs, which are usually five to seven years. So um, it, it's a pretty substantial price tag, but it all just falls down to a, to a numbers uh, game. Okay, Dr. Salomon, in our last minute here, you hopeful that any progress is going to be made on this? Well, you know, I we, we need to do something. We are definitely in a crisis. Um, we currently have a huge shortage, particularly in family medicine. Like I said, a million on over a million Ontarians don't currently have a family physician. Uh, obviously, having a family physician is the gateway into the healthcare system. It's the foundation of the healthcare system, and this is only going to get worse in the next five years. Um, increasing spots for international medical graduates is definitely a good one of a good short-term solution, but we need long-term solutions too, as this is going to get worse in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Um, we definitely should be increasing medical school spots as well, and it's, it's really unfortunate that we're sending um, people born in Canada to other schools in other countries to get trained and then say, okay, let's bring them back. I mean, it's kind of un-Canadian, don't you think? And they're spending three to four times the amount of money to go abroad and coming back here with huge or having huge debts. They so are. Those doctors they themselves. Are. Yeah. Yes. And so I would say we need to look at short-term solutions. This is part of the short-term solution, but also long-term solutions, which would also include increasing medical school spots in Canada. 
Gotcha. Mr. Director, can I have a four-shot, please, so I can thank all of our guests, starting here in the studio with Dr. Lisa Salomon, Scarborough Health Network, and Sinai Health. In the top right corner, Greg Mercer, whose work is available on the Globe website. Uh, really good investigative reporting by Greg Mercer. In the bottom left-hand corner, Dr. Rohit Gandhi, the ER doctor at the Hôpital Montfort in eastern Ontario. And in the bottom right-hand corner, Dr. Glenn Bandiera, St. Mike's, downtown Toronto. Thank you so much, everybody, for appearing on the agenda tonight. We're grateful for your time. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.